Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjunginlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today we're going to be talking about belonging. And right now in the culture where people's relationships to place to family, to friends, has been ruptured, and alienation has become commonplace. We wanted to circumambulate the idea of belonging, how central that is for the child to belong to the parents, how much we take it for granted that we belong to a family, a church, um, a social organization, And when those things are taken away, how do we regenerate belonging, which is so central to being human? So just to start with, you know, the word belonging means, or the etymology of the word means to go along with. When I think about it in that active way, I'm moved to think about that which I go along with and that which goes along with me. And it creates this interesting image of traveling together. When I think about my belongings, for instance, as I've relocated from one area to another, that I take those things that I wish to travel along with me over to the new house, and that which belongs to me then re-inhabits the environment. It gives me a very specific psychic sensibility as I'm transferred from location to location, which I think is part internal, part external, and in this liminal blending between all those things. Yeah. And we call all those things our belongings. And um, I have a a story of uh, neighbors uh, who had a samovar in their house, and the samovar had belonged to this woman's grandmother, who, along with her husband and children, fled Russia at the beginning of the 20th century or early therein, and trekked all across Russia and eventually to the United States with this samovar in her lap. It was quite a substantial object because it was a symbol of her roots and home of where you make the tea. I always liked that story of uh, fleeing on first um, a sleigh and a ship and so on. And was this her belonging or did she belong to it? But it was the symbol of home, where we belong. Well, and your story, Deb, really lifts up the experience of immigrants. Yes. And how that experience of uh, leaving where you belong and trying to create a new home somewhere else 
has such a tremendous psychic effect on mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. the people who do it, but it, it even reverberates down through the generations. You know, what were the circumstances under which your family left wherever they were from and came to the United States, for example, and, and left that sense of belonging and created a new one perhaps here? Exactly, whether that's a kind of violence to the trajectory of the family or whether or not that's a creative choice to move someplace where there's greater opportunity. And that makes all the difference. At the basis of belonging, I'm thinking about bonding and how central that is to the infant. Bonding to the primary caregiver, bonding to mom, bonding to the family. It's a huge process, and in relatively recent years, uh, starting with the work of John Bowlby and moving on to Mary Ainsworth and others, attachment, an attachment theory is, is critical, especially in those very early years where we don't have conscious memory, but uh, it's imbued in our psyches, and it has a lot to do with brain development attachment of, does that baby belong to the mother? You know, there is a sense, um, they talk about the psychic umbilical cord for the first year of life between mother and baby. I'm building on your word, Joseph, of bonding and belonging. And, you know, I know there was no doubt in my mind that that baby was mine, Uh, belonged, attached, bonded, And then, of course, eventually, in a gradual process of growth and development, uh, we let our children go uh, in, in some way. It is inherent in human nature to want to belong. Uh, to belong in a club, to belong in college, to belong to an organization or an ideal or a purpose in life. So, Deb and and Joseph, both of you bringing up this uh, notion about attachment and belonging, where that brings me is that when we belong, we feel a sense of safety. Yes. That belonging creates safety. And that takes me um, to Abraham Maslow and a chart that's become, I think, very famous. And uh, there are lots of questions about does it really hold up uh, in research or uh, scientifically, but... Uh, What he posits is that first we have physiological needs for food and water and warmth and sleep and clothes and shelter. And then right above that is what you just mentioned, Lisa, which is our needs for safety, Uh, that we are being held. And with an infant, it's very literal. And then right above that is the need for belongingness and love of intimacy, friends, bonding a sense of being part of. And then uh, the the top two layers are esteem needs, which is prestige and a feeling of accomplishment. And then right at the top, the proverbial tip of the iceberg, because this is drawn as a triangle, um, is what he called self-actualization, fulfillment, achieving potential. So that kind of lines up with the Jungian idea of individuation being able to really grow one's innate and unique potential. And and thinking about them as a progression of stages, it also lets us know that when our sense of belonging does not develop for one reason or another or has been violated, it puts at risk all the further developments that that would stand on. Yes. Uh, Maslow posits uh, exactly that, Joseph, that each stage has to be satisfied before the next stage uh, can be achieved because basically it's a motivational thing that, you know, if you really need physical safety needs, those are going to take have priority over your need for, let's say, esteem. And I think they're more mutable than that. You know, there's a way that this makes intuitive sense. And yet, I also think that all through our lives, we need to belong. And recent research on 
uh, aging and aging successfully posits that it's not even as much about physical health. You know, do you use your seatbelt? Do you walk every day? Do you watch your diet? That the major factor in aging well is relational. And do we have bonds? Do we belong with uh, friends, um, maybe a religious institution, community institutions? Do we belong? Well, and we can, you know, see how this is just so hardwired because, um, you know, if you were an australopithecine out on the savannah (laughs) and you didn't belong to a group, you were going to be somebody's lunch. I mean, it really, you know, being shunned, being isolated, uh, being exiled from a community feels like a life and death matter because for most of human history, it was. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're really, um, in our culture right now, moving around that threat of being shunned. So much in this call-out culture right now, in the United States particularly, but in other nations as well, the idea that someone can rise up, make an accusation, a non-criminal accusation, and cause this enormous energy and this attempt to eject you out from the comfort of belonging into some kind of existential, you know, wilderness and the fear that that brings up for people and that they will then be ejected and not be able to survive. And th- this is being played out over and over again. And the threat of that causing a tremendous amount of anxiety, you know, in swaths of the culture. And what that does is it creates this pressure for uniformality, this pressure for hyper self-regulation. And we'll see this in communities. You know, for instance, if we think about uh, Mennonite communities that that practice this uh, idea of shunning, that the culture is highly, highly prescribed, even down to what kinds of clothing and how the facial hair is organized and the tasks that are Uh, put about. And in order to avoid being cast out, people have to surrender a tremendous amount of individuality. There are a lot of communities that have uh, such strictures around what it means to belong. And maybe underneath that is the tension of sameness uh, versus how we tolerate difference. What you've said really rings true, Joseph, about in today's culture with the polarities that we have, there's tremendous intolerance for a viewpoint or an opinion that is not the, let's say, politically correct viewpoint of one's particular political party or church or organization or cultural uh, cohort of Either you belong and you you adhere to the party line or the dress code, or boom, you're out. So this is obviously happening a lot at lots of different levels where people are getting mobbed on social media or they're getting called out at work. You know, I want to be careful here because I think that you know having a bunch of people attack you on Twitter is is not the same thing necessarily as suffering grievous personal injury. However. The effects that these kinds of events can have on people's psyches can be quite dramatic. It's not a coincidence that suicide risk goes up Mm -hmm. in cases where something like this happens. And I think it's exactly what we're talking about today, that your sense of belonging is threatened. You know, if you've just been um, called out, say, because you, you said something awkward or you know, a social media post from six years ago turns up that people have misinterpreted and you're being threatened perhaps with the loss of your job, but more so with the loss of your kind of sense of standing in the community, the fear that you'll never again be accepted. It really puts you in a pretty dark place. Right. There is this tension to homogenize in order to escape 
the violation of belonging, because belonging is, in fact, that important to us. And it it's related uh, so strongly to safety. Yes. Which you touched on a little while ago, Lisa, of, of that is our safety. We are social animals. We are made to bond. Uh, we are made to belong, to be to be connected, intimate, held, uh, interacted with. Uh, the list of attributes of belonging goes on and on, and it is um, really foundational. I think for our entire lives, it's not as if we outgrow these these early instinctual physiological and psychological patterns. They, they evolve and they become uh, more symbolic, we hope, and have a lot of more different shades of meaning, but we still need to belong. I want to lift up this tension between what we've been talking about, the need to belong, and the idea of individuation. Because we've been talking about uh, belonging and how there's a certain demand for conformity that comes with belonging. And the fact that individuation in some sense of, of how Jung meant this, meant exactly almost the opposite, separating out from the collective, distinguishing yourself from your tribe, figuring out where you uh, begin and they end. And I don't know that the two are necessarily polar opposites, but I do think there is a tension between them. Yeah. And it's perhaps already been referenced with your talk about Maslow, Deb, that, you know, I don't know that we can focus on individuation so much unless we have that basic sense of safety. Although, you know, you guys are welcome to argue with me on that. I'm thinking, again, returning to the idea of belonging coming from this idea of to go along with. And we could imagine it as a progression, uh, much much the way Neumann, I think, did, that we belong to a progression of objects. We belong uh, to the mother. We belong to our friends, our school, belong to our career. And at some point, if we're lucky, we have the experience of belonging to the self. And all of this has to do with bonding. And what are our primary uh, bonds and what are transitional bonds? And the reality that we will have to let go of something in order to belong to something greater. And I'm thinking about Jung's experience um, that he describes in his memoir, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, which is such a page-turner for anyone out there. <laughs> a great read, as well as much wisdom. But Jung talks about, I think after he's had his dream of the mandala center and the magnolia tree in the light, that he realized his life did not belong to him anymore. It's a great example of that realization of the self, a step in individuation, that he was there to serve mm -hmm. something greater, and he did so. Uh, with his writing, lecturing, teaching, he belonged to the world. I'm thinking of another way to bridge this tension between belonging and individuating, and that would be this notion of kind of give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Hmm. Jung uh, wrote in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections about his personality one and his personality number two, which was this realization that he had as a fairly young child that there were these two distinct parts of him. Personality one would sort of correspond with uh, the everyday ego, with the persona, whereas personality number two was kind of timeless and uh, represented this in inhabiting of unconscious wisdom. And, you know, in, in some sense, Jung had two homes in the world. One was in Kuznacht, and that was the home of personality one. That's where he saw his patients. That's where he belonged to Swiss society, and he very much did. He was very much a kind of a Swiss man 
uh, who who fit into the social currents and had a wife and children and sort of an ordinary life in some sense. And then there was Bollingen. And Bollingen was the home of personality number two. Yeah. So it might it might be that we have uh, a way that we belong to the world and to the community that we're in, and another way that we belong to ourself and the self. I really uh, like that, Lisa, of um, the personalities one and two, and the, maybe we each have a Kushnacht and a bowling in, and I'm appreciating going back to Maslow that Jung had Kushnak. He had a wife, he had a beautiful home, he had a place in society, he had um, financial well being, uh, never had to worry about that. Yeah, so it, he, helps, yeah. it helps when you marry the richest woman in Switzerland. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe she was only the second richest. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> But my, I think we're both circling around the point that um, Maslow makes with this stage theory of development, that having safety and belonging, security, certainly makes it much more possible to then develop one's uh, individual proclivities, passions, and internal life. So uh, I'm feeling a, a desire to pivot from the stable state of belonging a little bit towards the violation of belonging. And I found myself thinking about a friend who was probably a decade ago experienced a house fire. While she was gone, something or other occurred. They think it might even have been arson. Ooh. And uh, about half of her house uh, had burned down by the time the firemen had gotten there. And the majority of her belongings had either been destroyed or ruined by smoke and water. And the devastation of that, and then the incredible length of time it took to regenerate the sense of belonging, which walked in step with the regeneration and rebuilding of the home. So there was a, a, an entire part of my friend's identity that seemed to be destroyed with the burning of the home. And, and of course, the lack of safety, the thought that somebody would do this uh, harmfully and decisively is, is really horrifying. But also, in her belongings were invested you know, thousands and thousands of memories and narratives had been woven into that. And particularly any of us that have a extroverted feeling typology, we particularly anchor narrative into the objects that belong to us. So when our objects are destroyed, it's as if parts of our memories have been turned to ashes, and we begin to feel like we will never remember again the things that were anchored to what was destroyed. So even parts of the soul feel alienated and no longer belong to us. Yeah, I think um, our relationship with our belongings is very, very powerful. Uh, and it's it doesn't feel real to say, well, you know, they were only things. You know, I, I can replace those things or get new things because they hold our history. Well, it's like the samovar. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. like the samovar. They hold our history and they reflect us back to ourselves. That it's this lamp, these books, that rug, these pictures on the wall, where I feel at home. Uh, and we all know it. I mean, anytime any of us goes to a hotel, uh, remember when we could do that. Um, <laughs> but it's impersonal. It's all very nice. Uh, needs are met. There are bedside tables and, you know, everything one needs to uh, rest and be comfortable. But it sure isn't home. You know, another way that this sense of belonging can be violated, I think we're seeing it with the pandemic. Oh, because, yes. you know, there were there were things that we belonged to before the pandemic, whether it was an office that we went to every day or uh, a book club or um, 
uh, any number of uh, church, any number of other places where we congregated with a sense of belonging. And now we might be doing it over Zoom, but it's not it's not the same. We yeah. don't have the physical presence of others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think that that is affecting us in ways that we may not even be aware of sometimes, but we're all kind of aching for reconnection with, with these groups that have held us to which we have belonged. Even something as mundane as the coffee shop uh, down the road that you always go to in the morning, or when you have some work on the laptop to do, if you're uh, doing that on a weekend or you're self-employed, people love to go to the coffee shop and belong there among strangers who are coming in and going out. And maybe you say hello and uh, exchange some pleasantries with the baristas. There's a belonging there and a connection with other people and a place. I think it's just part of who we are as the creatures that we are. Jung used to talk about the creature atura, and I want to honor that part of us. And that brings me to, I think, a core reality that physical touch is evidence of belonging. Mm. That the infant knows it belongs because it is touched and it touches And so the senses provide the first frame of belonging. And in this world of Zooming and other kinds of virtual contact, the evidence, the artifacts of belonging have been lifted away. And longing now becomes this strange talking screen, and we're trying to recreate a sense of belonging through hearing, which which is certainly part of it, but is not adequate. Yeah, you're, you're you're so right about that, Joseph. That's really that's really lovely. The importance of touch, and you know, you think about in in, in European cultures where there's the the kiss on both cheeks when you greet, or you know, you shake hands, or you you hug a friend when you haven't seen them in a while, or when you're parting, and just these these moments of just actual physical connection. We're just all kind of starved for that. And even smell is a, is literally a kind of physical connection. You walk into the coffee shop and it smells like something. It <laughs> smells like dozens of things. And when you're smelling, kind of molecules in the air are kind of colliding with the nerves and the olfactoric nerves inside of you. It's a form of something reaching to you um, that that enlivens you. One of the, one of the strange things about staying in one's home for months and months and months is a deprivation of scent that there's there's so little variety. I know that sounds really odd, but it affects us neurologically. Mm -hmm. I had an experience once I, uh, we actually, it was during one of the um, IRSJA conferences and we were out in the Midwest somewhere and uh, I and a couple of buddies went on a tour of, I think it was the Mammoth Caves. It was a long, like, two-hour tour through this incredible cave system. And uh, at one time, the cave had been used uh, in an attempt to treat tuberculosis victims because it was thought that the regulation of the temperature and the humidity and all of these other things would be very helpful But one of the things that happens when you're deep in a cave is that all of the scent molecules actually degrade. And so the air in these deep, deep caves is devoid of any kind of scent. And I remember finally coming out after about two hours and having this (laughs) forest, you know, kind of (laughs) just uh, assault my, my olfactory senses and and how the restoration of relationship to the to the world was restored in that moment. And interestingly enough, that's one of the things that's also violated in COVID, is that scent and taste uh, go away often for a large percentage of people who are infected. Mm-hmm. 
This must be why I've been obsessively buying various perfumes during COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, just leaning into another way where our sense of belonging can be violated. I'm thinking about if we grow up in an alcoholic family. Mm. Uh, there are lots of things that go along with that experience, but one of them is that we do not feel like we belong. This is almost universal. There's a deep sense of shame because you know your family is different from other families. And so when I've worked with people who grew up with alcoholic parents, they often report that they didn't really socialize much with other kids. They didn't want to have anyone over. So they wound up not getting invited over very much. And there's, there's a sense that like my family is not like everyone else's. And so there can be a deep sense of isolation. And, and sometimes when those people come into analysis all these many years later, that is a core issue is a sense of, uh, you know, that I, that I don't have friends or I have difficulty making friends or I struggle to feel like I fit in in this community that I find myself in and that kind of thing. You know, I think we have circled around but not stated what you're touching on, Lisa, which is shame. Yeah. When the sense of belonging is violated, um, either because the child senses something is really deeply wrong and different in the home, or the shunning practices that we touched on earlier, and how deep that goes to our core, that that the person himself or herself is not acceptable. It's not what you did or didn't do. It's a sense of who you basically are and that a sense of belonging either wasn't sufficiently established or feels like it has been betrayed if you are ejected from uh, s some kind of a group or you're, or you're bullied and excoriated online. Uh, lots of ways of doing that, but that's how deep it goes. This reminds me of the whole category of secrets and how that can violate belonging, whether the secret is that mom or dad is, you know, drunk and collapsed in the living room every night. And one of the other secrets that are violate belonging is kids who are gay, you know, carrying this incredible feeling that if it were known that they would then be ostracized either at school or by their families. Some gay teens are literally cast out of their homes and they're living on the streets. So feeling whether it's shame because uh, of a shaming system in the family or all the various kinds of secrets that people can wind up holding, mm -hmm. that can violate the development of belonging. Yeah. Just sort of picking up there and talking about a different way that we can grow up feeling like we didn't belong. I want to just read something from Memory Streams Reflections. Jung said, as a child, I felt myself to be alone, and I still am, because I know things and must hint at things with which others apparently know nothing of, and for the most part do not want to know. Loneliness does not come from having no people about one but from being unable to communicate the things that seem important to oneself or from holding certain views which others find inadmissible. And then he says later, if a man knows more than others, he becomes lonely. And I find this with many of the people that come into analysis with me. They tend to be really sensitive, thoughtful people who may never have really fit in and I often find that cultivating that sense of belonging is often one of the tasks that we work on. And believe it or not, one of the things that I have done is said, go on over to the Paja website and take a look at the Philadelphia Jung Seminar. Because for some people with a certain worldview, you need to find other people who are going to resonate with that. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't always work, but but many people have found a sense of, of home and belonging in, in communities like uh, the Philadelphia Young Seminar. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's such a great illustration, Lisa, of, of where we don't belong and how differences are managed or not managed, of, of the kid that's different, whether it's young 
or a child that's gay. And yet part of the uh, part of the cure, as it were, is to find a new tribe. Yeah. There are other people like you out there who are sensitive, who, you know, may be different from the original milieu in, into which one was was born. Again, underscores this uh, incredible tension uh, between sameness as the price of connection and belonging versus difference. Of uh, can you still belong if you're different? Well, maybe you need to belong to a different tribe. I think this, as you said, the search for tribe, which by the way is what we're trying to do with Dream School as well with our educational platform. We are trying to reach out even to an international community of people and trying to call them to this common interest in dreams. So often what bonds a tribe or bonds people together is at least a singular dedication. And whether it's the Rotary Club and this dedication to philanthropic work, but sometimes a single value system can be strong enough so that the multiple other differences of age or language or socioeconomic status, all that stuff, is set aside, decisively set aside. So in our project, the idea that dreams are universal, but the interest in one's dreams is unique. And of course, we appreciate that in all of our listeners, but that also can bring people together. It's such a great paradox that you're pointing to, Joseph, that here here we have, in a sense, a tribe of people who are interested in their dreams and individuating. <laughs> well, and, and this goes back to, to this tension, right? But I, I think another truth is that we all have a need to belong, and we also have a need to stand out and feel special. And, and both of those needs... Um, you know, matter throughout the lifespan. I think that um, when we're adolescents, those needs really come into focus. I think adolescence is a time when we have a strong need to belong, and that obviously motivates a lot of behavior among teenagers. When I think about the military as a culture, I mean, it is structured along the lines of belonging and similarity. Even the process of boot camp when people's hair is shaved off, the sense of being returned to an equal ground with an equal sense of knowledge, and that from that, there's a sense of belonging ideally is then built up. And I think sports teams do very similar things. I am thinking about how uh, I think life itself calls us to deal with the loss of belonging over and over again, of your example, Joseph, about the military and these rituals of the, the military haircut and, and boot camp and sameness. And I'm thinking about how college students often project, I mean, we call it the alma mater, onto mm -hmm. their college and have a sense of identity with it, an identity with a sports team uh, the first job after college of like, oh, I really belong now to Corporation XYZ. I'm going to give it all I've got. And that oftentimes we are disappointed. We may feel betrayed. The sports team that a person gave their all to uh, benches that athlete because he's no longer quite as good as some of the other players on the team. And how we are forced over and over again uh, to hold that tension between uh, what we project onto a given organization, club, team, job, in order to grow more as individuals and accept our differences and separation and a sense of alienation as well. Yeah. Yeah, that is that that can come so hard, and I've certainly had oh. those experiences. Oh, me too. Oh, such disappointment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I feel like behind this, if we can use these disappointments and they're not traumatic, is the archetype of individuation that says you have to be you, 
you you cannot just invest a, a particular group uh, as the carrier of your soul. You have to find a home in yourself. Yeah, yeah. And this goes to that feeling of progressive belongings, that we belong to something for a period of time or they belong to us. And then as something shifts in the soul, as our identity matures or we withdraw a projection, something comes back to us and then the next belonging emerges. Mm -hmm. But I think the movement, particularly in our very individualistic structure, uh, country right now, is to be able to risk that question, who do I belong to? And to not avoid it. And who belongs to me? Right. Right. And, and to be able to tolerate the dislocation when we find that we no longer belong where we used to feel like we belong, like you were describing. Deb, I, I remember I was very, very invested in my, my first career and I had this, my identity was all wrapped up in it and it's kind of who I thought I was and I thought I discovered my meaning and purpose and then that fell away and it was it was kind of devastating. Mm -hmm. And I had to sort of sit in a not knowing place for a couple of years before I yeah. kind of, you know, found the next thing. And I remember thinking, well, what if I one day discover that this isn't right either? <laughs> but, but if that happens, I'll, I'll be here for it. So I, I want to just come back to this question that you had asked earlier, Joseph, is how do we regenerate a sense of belonging or how do we find a sense of belonging? And we've spoken about how important it is. It's actually healing. And this is the key behind the 12 step movement. One of the important things, perhaps the most important ingredient of Alcoholics Anonymous is that you are invited into a real community where you, you see the same people you go to, you find your meeting. People that, uh, that get invested in AA tend to sort of shop around at meetings until they find, oh, there's this great meeting. I love going to the Friday night meeting or whatever. And it's the people there that matter. And it's called the home group. Mm -hmm. They see the same people and then they all go out for dinner afterwards. And, and it's, it's a sense of kind of coming home and belonging. And it can be a very, very profound healing thing. So it, I think it goes to what you mentioned before about sort of needing to find your tribe. Yeah. Which is not always easy. And I'm thinking that in some sense, a very real sense, a psychotherapeutic and analytic process does that too, that this is the place uh, that people come home to in a certain sense. You know, it's, it's a consulting room, there's another person there, but also it's about finding your own home. What's, what's that person's internal, nascent home that we provide a, a container for it can be kind of the still place of the turning world that every Thursday we we go here uh, to find ourselves, paradoxically enough, together with someone else. And maybe that's a good place to switch to a dream? I think so. Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Before I start reading the dream today, I just want to say that I am the, the dream keeper on the team. <laughs> <laughs> I, I select the dreams each week. And 
I'm always on the lookout for dreams from men because about <laughs> three quarters of the dreams we get are submitted by women, which is wonderful. But I would like for there to be a little more equity. So if you're a man and you've thought about submitting a dream, I just want to encourage you to do so. And today's dream, in fact, does come from a 25-year-old man who uh, is unemployed and he has recently completed undergraduate studies. And here's the dream. I see our home landscape from air some distance away from the home as though I'm seeing it while hovering, flying in the air, a bird's eye view. I see that the bungalow, that's our home, is in a ruined condition. The building appears deserted, a destroyed habitat in time of apocalypse with its bare skeleton remaining, the base and some misshapen columns. Like the one in destroyed cities of war-torn Syria, except there are no large number of buildings in the vicinity, it's the only building in the area. During one time that I dreamt this recurring dream, I saw my paternal grandfather walking around the building, and when I approached him, he kind of said with his body language, what do you want? I got nothing, and the dream ended. Here's the context. I'm lost in life after undergraduate studies, estranged from parents who were and are emotionally neglectful and or inadequate, combative relationship, lack of personal relationship with paternal grandfather. And the feelings in the dream were confusion, sadness, loss, emptiness, dejection, some anger, and a small amount of grief. Well, this, you know, almost was made to order for our topic for today. Um, and I, I can feel um, the sadness here in this dream about the loss of home uh, that is imaged in a number of ways in this in this dream. Of uh, first, he sees it from a distance; it's ruined, a destroyed habitat, maybe like in war-torn Syria or someplace else. So there's been a battle, and then um, the image of the paternal grandfather, the grand father from an archetypal perspective um, who is rejecting uh, and I wonder if um, you know here is he says it's a recurring dream of you know how to find home where is home going to be and I'm thinking of what you said Lisa um, before of having invested so much in your first job and then being devastated when um, somehow things ended and how difficult this kind of transition can be. One thing has ended, but where and how will the next uh, be regenerated or generated? I find myself thinking about the destructive forces in the psyche. That we could externalize this and think, well, the relationships in the home were devastating and that has creates a problem. But I find it interesting to wonder what's happening in this young man's psyche mm -hmm. such that this kind of um, destruction is wreaking havoc in there. And that speaks to the way that we internalize neglect or other problems in our early childhood or early infancy, that there can be an internal environment that does not permit the person to either create or maintain inner objects that give them comfort. And that can lead to a chronic sense of self-alienation and anxiety. Fairbairn wrote a little bit about this when he was hypothesizing about um, the psyche of the neglected child. Often that when someone like this is imagining their own potential, maybe they have a capacity to write a book or to go uh, on for a master's degree or to date somebody they're interested in, that those potentials are often have to be locked away in a very, very tight internal container. Because when they begin to emerge as possibilities, 
the general hostile and negative internal environment begins to make that impossible, either feel impossible or feel transgressive or in some way be disallowed from incarnating. I'm sort of thinking about where this person is in his life. I think I think he said he was 25 and had just finished a university degree. And I, I think everything you're both saying, kind of looking back at the developmental trajectory and how that has shaped this dreamer's psyche and presumably uh, contributed to uh, these images appearing in his dream, I think is is true. And I'm also thinking about it prospectively a little bit because at this point in life, it often is time to leave home. Yeah. And sometimes we don't we don't want to leave home. There's the refusal of the call. There's the sense of wanting to stay and and rest in the land of childhood. And sometimes we do have to face kind of the desolation of that home before we have the courage to leave home. So I'm, I'm thinking about him sort of seeing that, you know, there's there's nothing there for him, that it is an image of loss and grief. And it also points him out toward yeah. his own future, sort of the other side of it. So in a way, um, this is kind of like the fall of Adam and Eve being ejected from the garden. Uh, and in this dream, it depicts it as uh, it's a ruined landscape. That there's, it's gone. You have to leave now. I'm thinking that there might be a kind of um, hopeful, prospective hint here of where Psyche is already going. Right at the outset, in the situation as it is, he sees the home landscape from the air some distance away as though seeing it while hovering, and it's a bird's eye view which calls up for me the image, alchemical image of sublimatio, of rising above and seeing something um, whole from a distance. And I wonder if that indicates in some way he's already left. Yeah, I think that's great, Deb. I, I really love that. And I'm picking up on the fact that it's a recurring dream. Mm -hmm. So there's something, there's some message Consciousness hasn't gotten yet. So absorbing all of that and the idea of the transition through the 20s, if the dream is compensatory, then it may be that the conscious personality is trying to regress back into the child position, seeking to return to this way of either being held or supported in the home. And that the psyche is making it very clear that the fantasy of the return to childhood has been annihilated and that there is a block against a regression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the flaming swords barring Adam and Eve from ever returning. Mm -hmm. The hopeful note, the prospective note is now you have to go on. And I think that's life calling us. There's nothing to do but to move into the next day and the day after that, as difficult and painful as this time may be for him. It's a call. It is the call to move to the future. Absolutely. That's just what I was thinking, a call to make a plan and to mm -hmm. pursue it, even if you're not sure it's the best plan. <laughs> you know, I want to add here, he's 25. It's never the best plan, but that's not the job. Uh, the job is uh, keep moving, make a plan. Uh, it, it'll be okay. You know, actually, I mean, I, maybe I'm just restating stuff we've already said, but I think this dream is a really beautiful example of Jung's um, energic and final viewpoint versus the um, retrospective um, viewpoint. So because we can look at this dream and say, this is about childhood trauma. This is about parental neglect. Mm -hmm. This is about loss. This is about sadness. And I think it is all of those things. Yeah. And it's about like, there's nothing left, time to move forward, you know? And even the great father is kind of urging him forward. The great father's saying, there's nothing here. You've, you've got to move on. 
So it's really a lovely both and. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.